And we are live. How's it going, everybody? Welcome once again uh, to our amazing conference today. And this is the first panel uh, of the evening, morning, whatever it may be for you, paving the way to STEAM using media to inspire the next generation. Moderated by me, I am Ron Sparkman. Uh, you may know me as the Space Dude. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief at Stardom and, of course, the chief curiosity correspondent for the Space Foundation. And today we have an incredible uh, group of folks to talk to about this particular topic. And uh, the first uh, person that we have on the panel today, Kelly Girardi, is an aerospace professional and science communicator. We also have Diana L. Cindy, known as the Arabian Stargazer, uh, Dr. Chris Ferry, uh, University of Technology in Sydney, associate professor and author, and uh, Shelley Brunswick, chief operating officer of the Space Foundation, and Dr. Ray uh, Abramovich, the Ramon Doctor of Philosophy uh, at DCASC. So you can tell everybody what that is if you want to, because I don't know what all that stands for. <laughs> so we're so glad to have you all on today. And uh, this is a wonderful topic. Um, <laughs> I understand completely. Uh, so uh, this is a wonderful topic. Kelly, I want to start with you first. Uh, what drives you to devote so much time towards suborbital flight and getting more people involved? Uh, you know, Obviously, Project Possum is a big piece of that that we're both involved in. So I'm sure that has a, a bit to do with it. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I love talking about science communication. Um, I think suborbital space flight to me has always represented our biggest opportunity to democratize access to space, right? When you think about the fact that, you know, we have less than a thousand humans who, who have ever been to space in the entire history of humanity, and you think about the capability of suborbital space flight to open up access to space for civilians, for researchers, for students, yes, for tourists, right? one company in their first or second or third year of commercial operations can single-handedly double the amount of humans who have ever been to space. So that's sort of the, you know, the value proposition that I like to look at when I think about how we can really open the fire hose on access to space and democratize it and ensure that, you know, this future for all of us, space is our collective past and future as a species. And we need to enable more access to it for a broader slice of humanity. So I think, you know, long answer short, that's something that's really driven me to invest in that specific area. And uh, in one of the ways that you've uh, kind of utilized this is through social media, like uh, so many people on our panel today, and uh, you've written a new book. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about what your goal uh, with writing Not Necessarily Rocket Science was and how that's connecting people? Yeah, absolutely. So first, I'll, I'll share with everyone my deepest, darkest secret, which is that I have a film degree, right? I, I don't come from a traditional STEM background. I discovered, unfortunately, after college that my big passion was space and armed with a liberal arts degree, I was like, okay, how in the world do I contribute <laughs> to you know the, the final frontier, the world's most exciting industry? And I had to carve my own path. I, I felt like I, I really needed to prove that I could belong and access um, this industry and then create value inside of it. And so I wrote not necessarily rocket science as a way to share that path for other people and to show that, you know, I, I think that the space age, like much like the Renaissance, uh, was a broader cultural movement. It wasn't just art, right? You saw cultural innovation happening across science, philosophy, even warfare, medicine, science, right? So too does the space age have a broader cultural impact. It's not just engineering and our next giant leap will require the talents of artists, engineers, and everyone in between. So I wrote the book to share a little bit of my journey in this industry and to show other people that, you know, there is a place for all different skill sets. I agree with you completely, DJ. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that there was a place uh, for me and it, it, there really is. It's it doesn't matter what you do or where you've come from. Uh, we need everybody for the space industry. And that's what it, what makes it so important. Uh, so um, the next thing I want to go to is, Diana, uh, you've been doing some incredible work for the last few years, reaching out to not just English speaking, but Arabic speaking groups uh, through the Arabian Stargazer. So I want to talk a little bit about that and uh, just how quickly that exploded. It was pretty much, you know, a little less than a year, 100,000 followers on just Instagram alone. So I want to talk a little bit about the importance of that to you, how that got started, and uh, how you're utilizing that to uh, to connect people. Yeah, um, it's very nice to be here and seeing familiar faces. Thank you for having me. Um, the Arabian Stargazer, if the people who are watching are not familiar, it's a bilingual science communication uh, platform where we talk about science and specifically space and the importance importance of it, as well as sharing some tips and tricks that I use that I wished I knew when I was in college throughout my career. Um, I think the reason why it reached a lot of attention at the beginning, because it's kind of um, uh, a neglected 
career and industry in that region. Um, a lot of people who are interested in space and science didn't really have someone speaking about that in, in a fun, short passion. It, it was, you have to read a scientific journal in order to learn a few things. And there wasn't really a lot of access and opportunities in, in that area. So I noticed that there's a gap in science communication in Arabic. Um, I researched YouTube and uh, a lot of platforms about people who are speaking about science and space and sharing their experience. And unfortunately that didn't exist. So when I created the Arabian Stargazer, it was kind of uh, coming from the idea that you should be excited about science. It's not intimidating. A lot of people in the Middle East and everywhere, honestly, in the world has the idea that you have to be very smart, uh, a genius in math. Um, you have to go to space to be part of space, which is not the case. I'm an engineer. I've worked in, in propulsion for the past seven years, and I don't necessarily wear a space suit when I go to work. And that's often kind of the the impression uh, behind my job. So just trying to fill in that gap. And I've seen amazing engagement. Many people are really interested in this. And I get messages of people who are, who say because of the Arabian Stargazer, now I'm messaging you from my dorm in Stanford and I'm originally from Egypt. I never thought I would be here uh, without knowing that I actually can do this. There are scholarships and there are things that I could do to be a better scientist or engineer. Um, so that's just kind of in a nutshell. And you have done incredible work over the last few years. And I know that you have uh, a big dream one day. So can you tell us if there was one STEAM project that you could magically fund for students in the Middle East, what would it be and why? Have you, you ever thought, maybe, may, maybe you've know. thought about this before. <laughs> <laughs> you know the answer to that. So, I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> my uh, ultimate passion is to build multiple science camps across the Middle East and hopefully expand to the world. Um, that would be just teaching them how to do simply programming and how to make a presentation, uh, building a satellite. One of my uh, most memorable memories is being in college, uh, leading a team of, uh, of students who are working on a 6U CubeSat that is going to space. And I was part of a NASA competition. I would never be excited about space without that opportunity. Um, SEDS, it's called SEDS, uh, Students for Exploration and Development of Space. And from then I realized that just school and my degree is not going to make me um, a unique engineer or is going to teach me tangible skill sets. Um, so I want to kind of create the same experience in the Middle East, create competitions, and we would teach them everything they need to know about being an engineer in a non-traditional way, not a textbook uh, kind of path. And I mean, so everybody on here is communicating to people in different ways, but Chris, yours is a different audience. So uh, you want to tell us a little bit about why you decided the group that you wanted to speak to in the, uh, in the awesome work that you're doing? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I think it was because I had kids of my own. Um, I wouldn't even have been aware uh, of the existence of children's books um, ha had I not had children of my own. And, you know, when you look at the children's literature, uh, at least maybe six years ago, um, you would find that there wasn't a lot of uh, science books, no, certainly not for for babies. And I mean, if if you don't, if you've never interacted with babies and you don't have babies, you'll you won't know that uh, baby books come in these kind of hard cardboard, uh, thick uh, style books. And there was no science books. There's all ABCs and animals and these sorts of things. And I thought, wow, there should really be some science books for for this age group. And and I decided, oh, hey, I'll. I'll give it a go. I'll try it uh, on my own, and I, I did, and it seems to have seems to have stuck. Yeah, it's it's a little it's a little popular. So, what's the most complicated thing you've ever tried to explain to a baby? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, uh, the surprisingly the most popular book is Quantum Physics for Babies. Um, the publisher told me they waited so long to contact me about it because I had originally self-published it uh, because it, it it should never work. That was their research. Um, so yeah, uh, so it's quantum physics, uh, you know, uh, full disclosure, it's it's for the parents, it's not for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> There's no test for the uh, infants at the end. <laughs> So uh, obviously th these things are really kind of blown up. You, maybe it wasn't something that you were expecting. As you mentioned, uh, they were kind of telling you, well, we're not exactly sure if this is going to work. So um, 
how have you been able to reach out and use this in different ways, say like utilize YouTube uh, videos in general in a way to inspire the next generation with these, these really, if you can, if you can, I think it was Einstein that said, if you can break it, if you can't break it down and explain it to somebody on a level that they understand it, then you don't understand it. And trying to attempt to do that with quantum physics, with astrophysics is just one of those things that if you can do that with, you know, you know, the parents more so than the children, uh, then you know that you've done your job right. So what are the ways are you kind of utilizing this, uh, the skill set that you have to connect with folks? Yeah, it's really difficult um, to be honest. So if you think about in the typical audiences on Instagram, you know, you certainly have, as as the great scientific communicators in this panel have shown, um, you know, audiences for science, um, but they typically don't coincide with audiences that are buying children's books and and you know, baby, you know, merchandise, right? So, so my following on social media is quite small because my tip, my audience, is the audience that would typically follow people that are selling more traditional. Uh, stuff for kids, so I think it, I, th I find it very difficult um, to connect to to find these even find the people that have my books online. Um, I'm assuming maybe many of them you know aren't on social media. I, I think we're at over five million copies of books worldwide, um, and I see lots of pictures online of of, um, of kids with with my books. Um, but the, they don't seem to be the kind of people that want to engage in the same way as as with science communication. I think with science communicators, you know, people follow them on social media because they want to to learn cool facts and and hear from their from their favorite um, from their favorite educator. Whereas uh, you know, people that buy baby books, I think you know they uh, I can attest they have a different set of priorities. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, your, your work has been wonderful. And again, we have so many authors that are on uh, here today. And uh, so, Shelly, I want to go to you next. There's a lot of amazing ways that we connect with folks uh, in the science communication uh, arena at the Space Foundation. So as our COO, uh, how are you working to get people into the space industry? Because for you, it's not just one particular group. You're interested in how can we get everybody involved? And, uh, you know, it's one of the one of the best parts about the job that we do. Well, thank you, Ron. It's an honor to be joining you as well as the other esteemed colleagues today to talk about this important subject of how do we break down barriers to allow more access and opportunity into the space economy? And that includes, as you said, STEM jobs, but also non-STEM jobs, artists, business administrators, entrepreneurs, as well as STEM professionals. And so it's important at the Space Foundation that we go through our five-step workforce development roadmap. And that involves awareness, access, training, connecting, and mentoring. And each one of those uh, steps allows us to break down barriers to allow more access into the space economy. And so it's exciting to be part of that. And this falls under our Center for Innovation and Education at the Space Foundation. And that's all about creating workforce development and economic opportunity so all individuals uh, can participate in the space economy, especially as we look at the space ecosystem growing, from over $400 billion to one to $3 trillion. We need to find a way for those who have not been part of the space ecosystem to find a pathway in. And uh, so there's another organization that you've been working with closely this year. Well, one of a few, I guess I should say, uh, and that's Space for Women. Um, and it's it's been an incredible group. I've met a lot of wonderful uh, people through that program. Uh, you introduced us to it. And we were sharing it out on social media. So lots of new friends this year. Uh, but how is Space for Women playing a role in building the next generation in STEM and uh, STEAM? Well, again, thank you for asking that question. Uh, the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs created the Space for Women program. And under that is the Space for Women uh, Mentor Network program. And I am one of 35 mentors around the world that participate in that. And there are other men and women that participate in the program. And our goal, again, is to create that access and opportunity so that girls and women around the world can find their way into STEM careers, but also the overall space economy. And again, that relates to STEM careers, but also entrepreneurship opportunities. Great, great opportunity um, in developing countries that are emerging into the space economy for women to be part of the, of the ecosystem using space-based technology to start a business to help their family, to help their community. So when we look at the space-inspired um, economy, we have to remember those entrepreneurs that may be taking and utilizing space technology 
to create a business. When you think about GPS, most people don't think about the $1.3 trillion economy GPS has unlocked since 1983. So as you think about the space economy, think of those other areas, the internet of things, 5G, miniaturization, advanced manufacturing, data analytics, cybersecurity. Those are all great jobs right here on earth that can be unlocked by entrepreneurs. And if you're looking for a great idea to unlock through entrepreneurship, NASA has a wonderful website for tech transfer, patents they have from the space program. ESA, the European Space Agency also has one. So again, we want you to look at those STEM careers. We want you to be artists. We want you to be entrepreneurs. So there's never been a better time than to be part of the space economy than right now. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Dr. Ryut, I want to go to you next on this. Um, with all the amazing work that you do, one of the big ones is DMARS. That's how we connected some years ago when we did uh, our interview for uh, the Mars Society and uh, Red Planet Radio. So quick plug there for, for, for over there. I just want to make sure they get a smile into. Uh, but um, you've really been doing amazing work with that. So uh, I want to first have you share what that is for folks that may not know. If they don't know, uh, they may know some of the U.S.-based uh, simulations um, but what you all are doing over there is amazing work and how that really matters in communicating the science, uh, because analog missions are truly something special. And the same, a, a bit of the same, too, with what uh, Kelly and I do with citizen scientists, astronautics program like Project Possum. You get out a whole lot more to regular folks when they realize that regular folks can do these types of things. So definitely want to talk to you a little bit about your work there. OK, so thank you very much. Um, so I have co-founded together with a group of people DMARS, which is Desert Mars Analog Remote Station. I've been the scientific director and I also been an analog astronaut out there in the desert, in the Israeli desert, in the Ramon crater, which looks and feels like Mars. And we've realized that we have a very unique natural resource at our uh, disposal that we can use in order to bring as many people as possible into science and specifically into the space sciences, into the beautiful age of the golden age of exploration of space that we are now at. And I'm very happy uh, that that initiative took off. And we have several analog missions. As a science director, I had to build up my team in order to make sure all the different tests, uh, all the different experiments, how would they work, how to explain them um, to the PR people and to students who come and look at our work. Uh, we had international and national collaborations. We had uh, almost three experiments per day for an average, on average, on, a, on an analog mission. And uh, just recently, I was able to actually publish a peer-reviewed article on the scientific uh, experiments I did, I did myself with the team there about cross-contamination issues in a planetary mission. So the beauty of this is that we're using this platform as a, to, to make people understand and come and even we... Um, we choose certain individuals which are happy to put their time into it and training into it. And we are very happy to let them understand in their bones what it means to be in an, in an isolated planetary habitat. And you have to do um, all these experiments. You have to take care of yourself. You have to take care of your crew. It's usually six to eight people inside a habitat. You have a delayed communication. So we're doing this analog simulation thing. But we're really, at this stage, it's just the beginning. We're really open to a lot of people and ideas. And what we find out is that we find that people are really hungry for this kind of a thing. Even though now, because of COVID, there's a bit of a delay in all our um, operations, even though we do them in isolation, it's a different type of isolation than what the regulations are now, are now requiring us. But for instance, we're going to have an international collaboration with the uh, Austrian Space Forum. They are coming uh, this October, November to Ramon Crater to do a full-on mission from the, space, um, from the Austrian Space Forum. And they have a much more uh, massive, uh, experienced uh, platform. They're going to use something which is called Exploration Cascades. And what I found out is that in being a science communicator, you know very well that there is a huge gap that you need to jump over in order to get people to understand what it means to do science and what is a good science. It's really not that easy. And when you have such a beautiful platform, just like the suborbital flights, I imagine, and other things as well. You need people to engage physically, mentally, and emotionally in doing a little bit of science outside in their own world, and then they can understand what it means to do science. In addition, because I'm there and other people there, we do a lot of, um, <clears throat> we promote a lot of women activity within these, in, the, in that platform, because we want to see more women in sort of like role models 
and doing science and doing engineer. Israel, even though it's, it's quite innovative in some aspects, in other aspects, it's very religious, it's very conservative. Most women talk about how it's uh, happy to be at their house, at their home, having children, raising a family. <laughs> it's very hard for us to get people out of their comfort zone and talking about different things like, okay, but if you could work and live in space, what would you like to do? And this kind of a platform let people play a serious role. It's a serious analog mission. And they understand they can do other things as well. And they, they spread it inside their communities. And it's just a very, it's a blessing to be part of such a project. So and, that's uh, the DMRs, yes. See, <laughs> I do uh, other stuff other, other than that. <laughs> well, uh, then let's talk a little bit about that, what you do at the uh, Davidson uh, Institute for Science Education. Um, right. what, what, how are you reaching out to folks there? How are you communicating the science? How, how did you get involved with the Institute? Uh, tell us all about it. So I got involved with the Institute through Professor Oded Haronson from the Planetary Sciences. Um, he wanted, he introduced me to the Davidson Institute because they didn't really have a really good handle on space sciences and they needed someone who had a PhD in that area, who was a good communicator, who can um, help their staff in order to spread out the word. So basically him and then uh, another person who wanted me to do, uh, help him write and create an astrobiology centered module inside a big problem, inside a big program, which we call the Young Astronaut Academy. Now the Young Astronaut Academy, it's funded by the Israeli Space Agency. It's for junior high, sort of like 15 year old. And we train them a year and a half as astronauts without the suborbital flights, unfortunately, but we are able uh, to get them out to the field and do a lot of interesting stuff in the field as well as space sciences. And eventually they do an analog mission. So it's, I think it's the only place in the world where junior high, high school students uh, do analog mission. You train them for it. They do it without the supervision. There is an adult, but it's like 50 meters, 100 meters away from the habitat. And they, they need to come up with the experiments, with their schedules, what they're gonna eat, what they're gonna drink, what they're gonna do if there's like some sort of an emergency, what are the communication lines and so on and so forth. It's a lot of responsibilities, but on the way they do the science as well. And like I said, it's a great way to teach them about the science that they're being taught, whether in classes or through our program. So in the Davidson Institute, I help them with different uh, space issues that they need some help or advice or someone to communicate with. And also with this uh, Young Acad Academy program, which now I am the manager of it, but in the South of Israel. So I moved the program to the uh, Arava and Dead Science Center, which is a regional area. I'm much more interested in bringing space exploration to the periphery both the social periphery and both the regional periphery. It's area, uh, usually areas which don't get a lot of funding. Um, they're very widespread. A lot of towns are isolated a little bit from one another. I know it sounds crazy because Israel is so small, but trust me, there is an isolation issue down south. And you also get a lot of different population. You get Bedouins, you get Arabic, um, you get um, people from Ethiopia who came to Israel 20 years ago. And then you get also a lot of people from kibbutzes and Moshav and so on and so forth. So it's really interesting for me to try and do space exploration and put it to the next generation, basically, but do it in the south of Israel, where it's closer also to the Negev, to the Ramon crater. It makes the whole area so much more valuable for the people who are actually there. So that's part of also like bringing in the pride in your place and understanding what an amazing place it is, because it's like Mars. You can do space tech analogy. You can do you can try different experiments, different technologies, whether it's in agritech or biomonitoring, and you can show them that they're worth something. So it's a very interesting area to do the Young Astronaut Academy down in the south, and um, we have a one more year to go, and this has been a very challenging year for us, and we had to shift part of our teachings completely online, which was trickier than I thought, but we're happy to say that they will have an analog mission, and I think it will be a very interesting, like, once, one in a lifetime experience for junior high, for high school students, really once, one in a lifetime. So I'm very happy to do that. And aside from that, I'm doing a little bit of research as well, from astrobiology, extremophiles, and also very interested in cross-contamination issues and to understand if we have a planetary crew and they go into a new area, um, let's say the moon, and we're not expecting anything to grow or happen on the moon, but what happened with all the microbiota and stuff that the crew comes with? We are not sterilizing our uh, spacecrafts anymore. So some bacillus, some other stuff do survive. 
they go there, what happens to them? Do they go, do they undergo mutation? Do they spread somehow to the environment? Do they survive there? How long does it take for the spreading to occur? What happens when you have back cross contamination back to the crew? Does it affect their health? Yes, no, we don't know yet. It's just, you know, preliminary studies. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're doing at the moment. That's what I'm doing. Uh, it's it's incredible work really from all of you. So what I want to do as we wrap up here is uh, give each of you 60 seconds, a little bit of your own advice on uh, what you would want to let people know about being a science communicator, how you can be involved and what you can do. And then also where we can find you on uh, social media. So Diana, I'll go with you next. And then uh, Shelly, I'll go to you after that. You are muted, Diana. Sorry, guys. What had happened um, was. <laughs> I said, um, it was really great to have you here. Um, I got introduced to new people, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, my advice, um, to, if you want to be a science communicator, is try to find a niche, something that is special to your own brand, because at the end, we are brands and we are trying to do something um, that represent us and our personalities. Um, and, and just don't be afraid to start. Usually the start is the most difficult thing to do. Uh, trying to stay consistent is also very difficult, but when you do something that you're very passionate about, um, that passion is going to show and that's what people are going to be attracted to. Um, you can find me on the Arabian Stargazer on Instagram. Um, you can also email me, uh, any questions you have on the Arabian Stargazer at gmail.com. Fantastic. Thank you, Diana. Shelly, we'll go to you next. Same question. Well, thank you again, Ron. It's been an honor joining this esteemed panel today. And what I would recommend is if this is something you're passionate about, find a mentor. There are many mentoring programs out there. We mentioned one, the UN Space for Women. There's Women Tech Net Network. There's SGAC. Uh, there's so many others. So find a mentor and also be a mentor because you can be a mentor at any point in your career to help inspire the next generation. The other thing is build your network. If this is not an area you're familiar with or you're learning about being a science communicator or the space industry, start to reach out to those organizations I just mentioned, not only to find a mentor, but to start to com connect with other individuals that think like you, that are excited about the things you do, and start building uh, connections and collaborations so that you too can rise up and help the next generation. You can follow me on LinkedIn, Instagram. And also you can follow the Space Foundation and go to our website at spacefoundation.org. Again, thank you, Ron, and thank you to our wonderful panel. Thank you so much, Shelly. And uh, next, Chris, want to go to you. I mean, yours is a little bit different how you've done it. So tell us you know, the, the best way you think that people can reach out in what was a, a, a calculated risk and ended up being a good one. So uh, what's your advice there? Sure. Yeah. So um, you can find me and my handle is is below there. It should be um, on Twitter and uh, and you can reach out via my Twitter or that's my email, um, my web address as well, csferry.com. Uh, I guess my advice would be to practical advice would be to write everything down. So, you know, I had the idea for quantum physics for babies long before I ever you know, tried it out. And probably if I hadn't written it down and at least like sketched out what I what I was thinking at the time, it never would have happened. And if you're anything like me, then you'll you'll forget. And the worst thing is that you'll remember that there was something you were supposed to remember and you'll think, ah, what was that thing? I, I couldn't I know there's something, but I can't remember it. So write write everything down. Uh, put it in a folder, whatever, and go back to it uh, on a regular basis and you'll pick out an idea and, and something will have coalesced or you'll meet someone that uh, in your network and, and that's when the genesis of the idea will really start. Wonderfully said. Uh, Rio, we'll go to you next. Hi, thank you very much. Um, all I have to add is be the shaman of your community. Be the scientific shaman of your community, especially during pandemic time or other anxiety time. It's good that you know the science. Just start with your own community from the ground up. Don't flourish all over the place. Find what you're passionate about. Do the scientific work behind it and work with your own community. That would be the best blessing that you can bring. Thank you. You can find me on Facebook and on LinkedIn and on Twitter as well. Thank you. Awesome. And Kelly, you literally just wrote the book on it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, it's funny. Like when I think about this question, I think about how I used to feel so self-conscious when someone would call me an influencer or, you know, allude to a large social media footprint. 
But in reality, it's the advice that I would give anyone starting out, especially in an industry like this, because what is that? It's it's to have a platform is to have a voice and to have a voice is to have influence. And after a decade of whiteboards and war rooms, you know, I've learned that the people who are designing the technology hold the power to influence how it's applied. And in a high tech, high stakes industry like ours, like aerospace, it's in everyone's best interest that you cultivate this broadest perspectives and broadest possible set of voices um, to attack those complex problems of the future. And, you know, just, just to close out my thoughts on it, what really drives me to keep sharing, keep inserting myself in the conversation is when we talk about space exploration, we're really talking about the future of the entire human species, right? So you know, the stakes are too high for any single demographic to be steering the entirety of Spaceship Earth or steering the conversation or direction. So I especially encourage a, a wide variety of folks to find their voice in the conversation and, and start putting their thoughts out there. I told uh, Kelly, I think it was around the Humans to Mars Summit that I was uh, going to pay her to speak to teach me to speak that articulately all the time. Uh, so uh, listen, this panel has been wonderful. Thank you all so much for coming on and joining us today. Uh, your your insights are invaluable. And uh, so we are going to move on to the next panel. But uh, thank you to everybody. So, thank you uh, so much. It's been wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Been so Thanks, wonderful everyone. to have you. All right. We'll love. see everybody on the next one. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Love, Stay love. safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.